So in principle, the lectures are being recorded. We will see if that happens or not. Um, the deal in this course is the policy is that there are no recordings. <laughs> um, so there, there may be videos online, there might not be. If they go away, if they disappear or anything, you're still responsible for the material uh, in lectures. In any event, uh, my name is Justin Solomon. Hopefully you are all in the correct room. Uh, if you're curious, we are in 6.S955, which is Applied Numerical Analysis. This is the first time this class is offered, hence the confusing course number and ambiguous listing in the course bulletin. But I'm very glad to see that you all found your way here. And, and hopefully you'll stick with us in this new uh, offering in MIT's curriculum here. Uh, so before we get started, we're going to go through the usual boring logistical stuff that happens at the beginning of a class, and then we'll dive right into the, the content for the day. Um, so uh, in case I have not had the pleasure of meeting y'all, my name is Justin Solomon. I'll be the instructor for this course. Uh, this is, again, a new course that we're offering here in the department, kind of targeted toward late undergrad, early PhD student, kind of that range uh, in, in the numerical uh, analysis world. Um, the course lectures are going to be in this room. Uh, Tuesday, Thursday, what, 2.30 to 4, plus or minus the five minutes that MIT uh, mandates. Uh, and then in addition to that, I have office hours on Wednesday, 10 to 12. My strong plea to all of you is to show up. I'll do your homework for you. It's fine. Just come hang out. Like, I just want friends. And it's very quiet in my office if you don't come. Okay? So just, just it's 10 to 12. It's, I, I'll make you coffee. I got a machine in there. You know, whatever you want. Um, you, you know, don't leave your instructor just writing email. That's, that's no fun. Yeah? And you know, every, I, when you people post on Piazza during that 10 to 12 thing, it makes me very sad inside. Yeah. Um, in any event, uh, our TA uh, for this course is Chris. He's sitting right in front of me. Everybody say hi, Chris. OK. Uh, so, so Chris is a graduate student in my research group. So he is accustomed to dealing with this confusing professor. And if you guys get weird messaging from he, me, you can talk to Chris, and, and he'll tell you how to interpret. Um, so Chris has office hours basically after class. I think tentatively the plan is to hold them basically right outside of my office. There's actually multiple seating areas. Or if that doesn't work, I noticed there's one right outside of here. I'll let you figure that out. Yeah, that's up to you guys. Um, uh, but yeah, so the homeworks for this course are going to be due on Thursdays. Time of day, TBD. Chris and I need to talk about that. Um, but you can see that the office hours are sort of aligned to, to help you all with that. Uh, the one other kind of little piece of the puzzle here is this class will have a weekly recitation starting next week. It is optional. We won't take attendance. It is just to like go over kind of example problems and review stuff for the week or maybe answer questions you have. Um, so that will be led by Chris. Um, the department is weird about not giving us the uh, room number until the second week of classes. So we can't have one this week. But, but next week we will. Um, and, and that's a place where you can kind of go, you know, go over the material again and, and maybe some example stuff. Um, also on the logistical list, um, the logistics of this class are very straightforward. Oops. Um, we're going to be uh, using Canvas in a very minimalistic fashion as basically a place to drop your homework assignments. Um, and also where I can upload PDF of the course uh, content. We'll come back to that in a minute. Um, and then we'll be using this Piazza website to uh, have Q&A, discussion, and all that good stuff in addition to office hours. I think this is a very standard boring setup, but I always feel like uh, I should do it. Um, and all of this is linked on the Canvas site, which MIT should have added you to automatically if you're registered for the class. Um, right, so uh, I know this is the boring meta stuff. We're almost done, I promise. Um, the uh, textbook for this course is uh, something called Numerical Analysis, uh, or Numerical Algorithms, rather. It is written by uh, Solomon. Uh, I encourage you not to buy this textbook. Uh, please, if you do, it'll contribute about $2 to my, my annual sandwich fund, which is great. Uh, but uh, part of my reason for teaching this course is that I'm working on the second edition of this book. Um, and so basically the way that we're going to do this is that uh, there are PDFs of each of the chapters that will be put on Canvas kind of as we get to that content. My exciting task, which always snowballs by the end of the semester, is to stay at least two chapters ahead of you guys. Um, but yeah, so, uh, and by the way, I mean, I, I'm going to encourage you not to share these PDFs with your friends. It's not because I make any money with the textbook. In fact, the first edition is on my web page. It's just that, like, I prefer to release the second edition when it's done instead of, like, this kind of midway point. Um, but for all of you guys, we will, we will release the sort of latest version. Um, so here's the, uh, the deal. Um, basically, you know, as we work on new editions of books, our whole point here is to 
fix things that could have been improved from the first one. I wrote most of this book when I was a graduate student, so there's a lot of like useful indiscretion in there that needs to be addressed. Um, and moreover, there are typos. So I will offer all of you extra credit in this course. If you find typos, mistakes, whatever, um, or if you have a thoughtful change for the book, not you know just like, I would like you to cover X, um, you can post it on Piazza. The first person to flag one of those things will get an indeterminate amount of extra credit that I feel is appropriate. Um, but yeah, uh, and, and you'll be acknowledged in the book. So that's, that's the, the, the deal here. Um, and, and I guarantee you there are plenty of typos to go around, not to worry. Uh, and if you think it's any different from your other, from your other textbooks, you're wrong. Uh, but, but in any event, yeah, if you, if you can put that on, on, on uh, Piazza, that's probably the best thing. If like 12 of you all flag the same missing period, then obviously that's uh, you know, only extra credit for the first person. Does that, that make sense? Yeah. I love, I love I just the phrase extra credit and the whole room perks up. We haven't even started this course yet. It's amazing. Um, so here's how this class is going to be structured. We will have five homeworks, and that'll be the majority of the credit for your effort in this course. Um, I think the reality of numerical analysis is there are very few situations in life when you're like held at gunpoint, like under duress, and asked to like prove convergence of a numerical method. So I think it makes good sense to like have homeworks where you have plenty of time to think about them and process and do something a little deeper. This course is an applied numerical methods course. So um, the point here is, and, and we'll talk about this a little more in a few minutes, like we're really trying to look for numerical algorithms in practice. So the homeworks are going to be less about like prove that this algorithm works under this circumstance or with this initial data, and more like here is an interesting application of the numerical methods we've been uh, covering in this course, and then you'll do some math related to that, and then you'll actually code it up and see that it, it works. Right, so uh, the first two homeworks are already designed, um, and the first one is already on, on Canvas. So, so if you take a look at that, you'll see that essentially what the first homework has you do is you first have uh, several theory problems that are deriving this sort of numerical analysis of a very particular function that's extremely common in neural networks. This is called the log sum x function, which is exactly what it sounds like. <laughs> um, so the first thing that you do is kind of figure out like when is this a well-conditioned or an ill-conditioned function to evaluate. Um, and then I have you implement basically a classifier to like, you know, like an email classifier kind of thing um, based on the log sum x function. And I did it myself last week. Uh, I'm terrible at Python, but I managed, so all of you can too. Um, and indeed, it fails if you don't do the numerics correctly. So it's, uh, it's double checked by your advisor or your instructor here. Um, in addition to that, this course has a midterm, which is worth a negligible amount of points, uh, and then a final exam, which is worth a slightly less negligible, but still pretty negligible amount of points. If you have conflicts with either of these things, please let us know as soon as possible. Um, and similarly, if you need accommodations, all of these things, of course, it's no problem at all. Um, for the, uh, the final exam, I believe the date and time is released by the registrar, like next week. I, I don't, everything here is bureaucratic and confusing. Uh, the midterm is already on the course calendar, which is linked on, on Canvas, um, and it'll be in class here, okay? Um, Beyond that, uh, I have a pedagogical experiment this semester. Um, so the homeworks you'll notice are not very comprehensive. I mean, like, it's impossible to write a homework for a course like this that covers every little topic that, that we'll hit. Um, instead, it'll like, dive into like, some of the big stuff. So then in addition to that, like, we'll have a weekly little check-in quiz that I guess we'll post online. Um, these will be like three or four multiple choice questions that are designed to be easy. <laughs> the whole point is just to make sure you are keeping up with the content of this class a little bit. So it'll be to make sure that you're kind of aware, for example, in the first part of this class of the assorted matrix factorizations and some of the simple properties. They're not intended to be gotchas. If there's math, they'll be, it'll be kind of straightforward. That's, that's the goal here. Does that make sense? I notice if I don't include something like that in a class, then what will happen is at the midterm, that's when you learn all the material. And so we're trying to avoid that situation. Uh, and then finally, of course, uh, we'll, you know, if you're a really good participator, either in class, piazza, whatever, then, then we have lots of discretion to add points. Uh, I always put plus or minus in case somebody's wildly disruptive, but in, in my time teaching here at MIT, all of you are delightful, thoughtful, and interesting students, and I've never had to, to use a minus before. Um, in case you missed it, 6.S955 is a new course here at MIT, and this is a course that I'm excited to teach. Obviously, I wrote the book. I love this stuff. Um, and I'm trying to share my enthusiasm for numerical methods with all of you. Um, However, what that means is that everything is completely uncalibrated in this course. Um, there are likely to be homeworks that are way too hard or way too easy. <laughs> and, and that's just life in the city here. 
Uh, it's the risk that you take when you take those six-point S classes. Um, on the other hand, uh, what I beg of all of you is to stick with it. Um, if something feels hard, that's probably because it is. <laughs> uh, and if that's the case, then you're more than welcome to message the staff, come to office hours, and we'll work with you because we want you to succeed and learn the material. That's the basic kind of baseline assumption here. Um, grades at MIT tend to skew quite high. <laughs> I don't think there's any secret there. And I doubt that this class will be any exception at the end. Um, so I think that you're likely to be okay on that, that particular axis. Um, but, but really, I encourage you to kind of like use this as an opportunity to learn and to help us refine our material here and make ample use of all the resources we give you for, for learning. Does that make sense? Any questions about that? This is all the boring administrative stuff. Okay. Um, now, generically, you know, these are my useless mathematician advice, and then we'll, 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 we'll talk about numerical methods. Um, when you're studying for a course like this, it's, it's important to kind of be creative and really test your the limits of what you've learned. I think it's very easy to absorb material in lectures for like a numerical methods class and completely forget why it's useful or interesting. <laughs> like, like for instance, in numerical linear algebra, we're going like to learn all kinds of fun trivia, like how to factor a matrix like 12 different ways. And I think it's easy to kind of just remember a long list of these things and then totally forget why I'd want to use them, where they show up, what they do, you know, all that kind of stuff. Um, so be creative while you study for this course. Like, you know, take some notes, rederive formulas on papers, make sure that basically the phrase that, you know, pedagogical people use a lot is active learning. And I think in the most boring mathematical topics is the, the most important place to really test your, 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 your li the limits of your learning and, and so on. Okay, so with that, we're going to start talking about numerical methods. Um, to get started, just so I get a feel for who's in the room, I thought we'd have a few quick shows of hand. There are no wrong answers here. I'm so excited that you're all here. Um, but just so I roughly know, like, I'm guessing most of you are EECS -E -E students, is that right? Like, hands here? Yeah, roughly like 50%. Um, let's see here, math, uh, some flavor of engineering, aero astro, uh, mechanical, um, English, music, oh, never, bad. Um, uh, any, any departments that I forgot? Okay, so it's the usual mix, I would guess. And in terms of, of uh, the split, here, uh, undergrads, fascinating, the back of the room. Uh, graduate students, the front of the room, uh, and the middle back. Huh. Um, and I don't really know what I had in mind for the third bullet point, so I won't go into that. Um, good, so that's roughly the divide that I, I would have guessed for this class, uh, which is fantastic, and the good news is you're all in the right place. <laughs> um, yeah. So, so not to worry. Uh, in terms of sort of background material and expectations in this course, um, basically what we're looking for is some version of linear algebra and multivariable calculus. The, the department asked me to commit to a course number. I personally think that's kind of goofy because most of our graduate students have encountered that at another university and our undergrads encountered in like seven different places. Um, but essentially, linear algebra and multivariable calculus are tools that we are going to use constantly throughout this course. Um, in particular, like, I'll go through a small calculation in a moment just to give you kind of a flavor of the sort of things that we're likely to do. And then in multivariable calculus, is multivariable uh, differential calculus will be mostly what we need. Integrals will come up mostly just in one variable. Um, and then uh, basic coding in Python, the good news for you is that your instructor is terrible at coding, so you can be confident that your, your, your assignments will be very doable on that front. Um, but we are going to have you like, actually implement real-world applications. So for instance, the second assignment in this course, we're going to implement a shape deformation algorithm that comes from the computer graphics literature. It's like you're given a 3D model and you like tug on the hand and you want it to respond to your input. You'll see that this is a nice uh, application of QR factorization, SVD, all that good stuff. Um, that's an in-depth thing. <laughs> and you'll be interacting with like a 3D user interface. In this case, I've coded it for you, um, but it is going to require like figuring out how to load Python libraries and running them on your computer. Uh, if you're stuck on that kind of thing, you can come to either my or Chris's office hours, and we're more than happy to help you out. I certainly am, and Chris is nodding, so he is too. Cool. Any questions about the sort of background that you need for this course? So quiet. I will get you to talk. We're going to work on this. Okay. So I thought I'd give just like a very simple example of the kind of calculation that I would expect you all to be able to kind of parse in this course because it's basically sort of very exemplary of the kind of math that we're going to do in 6S955. I think I got that right. Um, and, and this is basically uh, our first time of many that we will see the least squares problem. So 
Uh, here's the, just, and, and this is really just an example of, of the kind of math that we'll do a lot of, where you have like matrices and vectors and transposes and products and so on. Uh, and, and we're going to be doing that very fluently throughout this course. So here, uh, for instance, like let's say that I wanted to uh, compute the norm of ax minus b squared. Then of course the first line here is just acknowledging that the norm of a vector squared is the same thing as the dot product of a vector and itself. Right? The second one is the fact that you know, if I have two vectors and I want to take their dot product, that's the same thing as doing like v transpose times w, right? If I think of a vector as like a column matrix. Uh, and from there, it's basically just expanding and using the fact that transpose of product is product of transpose. By the way, I hate PowerPoint math. We're going to do most of this stuff on the board. <laughs> but this is just like an example of like the kind of formula where you should be able to kind of be able to understand where all the equal signs come from in this expression. If you don't or if you need some warm up, that's fine. Come to office hours. We'll help you. You might notice a theme here. Cool. Any, any questions so far? They told me in my professor training that like, once you ask for questions, you have to like count to 10 in your head because there's this like tendency to just keep talking. And so like, you know, we, we really relish in the awkward silences in these lectures. Okay. Um, and on the calculus side, uh, really the machinery we'll be using uh, computing gradients and Jacobians. And then we're also going to make use of Lagrange multipliers. So if I have an optimization problem like minimize f of g subject to g of x equals zero, like how would you convert that into like a calculus problem? is the kind of thing to review. And so if this is something that like you've seen but it's been a couple years, this is the time to, to start reviewing it. But the good news for you is the very first chapter of this textbook is just mathematical background. And so it's a nice little review of, of exactly this kind of content to make this class kind of sort of self-contained. Uh, and if this is a bit rusty for you, what I'd encourage you to do is look at the end of that chapter. There's a whole set of little exercises there. Um, some of them are hard. I, I, I got feedback about this book that the exercises are too hard. That's my bad. Um, but you know, give them a try, and I think I think that's a good kind of way to gauge your, your understanding. Okay. Um, yeah. And fun fact. So I got a negative book review because the phrase "st" I, I I said such that, and apparently it's subject to, and people feel very strongly about this. Fun fact. Okay. Um, there's only one part of calculus that. We're not going to cover it in lecture, but I think it's unlikely to have been covered in our math department, in, unless you maybe took it in a very recent time. At least in my day, this was not something that we covered, which is something called matrix calculus. I'm guessing students here that have taken a machine learning course may have, have encountered this before. Does this phrase sound familiar to any of you guys? It's OK if it hasn't. Yeah, so essentially, here's the deal. A lot of times in machine learning and also just in numerical methods more broadly, the unknown variable of a problem will be a matrix. It won't be a vector, it won't be a number, right? So for instance, you know, I can think of a function of a matrix, like f of a might be like the Frobenius norm of a, right? And for those of you who don't remember what Frobenius norm is, that's okay. It's the sum ij of uh, a i j squared, okay? Um, so there are gonna be a lot of problems in this class where like, we're minimizing a function that inputs a matrix and outputs a number. Like hopefully this notation like kind of makes sense so far. And then the question is like, how do we differentiate this thing? You know, if I wanted the gradient with respect to A of F, I need to define this object. And, and technically in, in your, your, in your algebra class, you probably haven't maybe computed gradients of functions of matrices. The machinery is exactly the same. It's just that now we have two indices instead of one. So, uh, for example, uh, we can think of this as really, you know, like this giant matrix, which is like D F D A one one D F D A one two D F D A two one, and so on, like that. Okay, that's really the definition here. So, in fact, actually, just for for yucks, let's actually do this calculation. <laughs> so, what is the derivative of F with respect to element one comma one? So remember, f is the sum of everything squared. And no, you all know the answer to this. Yes? Yeah. 2a11. Any questions about that? OK. What's the derivative of f with respect to element 1, 2? Louder. Everybody at the same time. 
thank you. Two a one two, similarly two a two one and so on. And notice that a slicker way of writing that is just like this, right? So notice that the gradient of f is a matrix, right? Which makes sense because f inputs a matrix and f was a number. So this notion of taking gradients of functions of matrices is just like a, basically a notational convenience. Um, this is covered in chapter one of the, the book in, in a few pages. By the way, only in the second edition, so, so don't, don't download the PDF off my webpage. Um, and, and I just think it's, it's a convenient thing. So like here are some, some formulas. There's a giant table of matrix derivative formulas in the book. Um, all of them, basically the proof looks like this, like you kind of expand into indices, differentiate, and then kind of contract again. And the convenience is that like once we do this, then when we do calculations in this class, we're not going to have to deal with a ton of indices. Does that make sense? The other kind of useful thing to know, by the way, is that if you want a really obtuse formula, this is the trace of A transpose A, um, which is also kind of a useful thing. Okay. That, I think, covers all of the sort of background, warning, logistical stuff, all that kind of thing that I wanted to cover today. Um, any questions about that? I'm guessing the answer is no. You're killing me, guys. Okay, fantastic. So um, we're going to do a quick overview of this course, and then we'll, uh, we'll dive into some technical content for the day. By the way, you, you'll notice on um, the website, I'll post um, the slides like this. Don't worry. Like, secretly, this is PowerPoint just because of the camera, but, but I will post the PDF that was generated by, by LaTeX. Um, the, uh, right, so, so the, the slides here are not proportional to lectures. It's very hard to design lecture slides that evenly divide into an hour and a half. So essentially what we're going to do in this class is just kind of go topic by topic. So it'll easily be the case in the middle of a lecture that we switch to another deck, which is going to happen momentarily. So prepare yourselves emotionally for, for that, that new title slide. Okay. But essentially in this course, here's our goal. I think oftentimes when we're designing tools in machine learning, in computer graphics, in computer vision, in scientific computing, almost any corner of the computational universe these days, I would argue that we're, we often do kind of two skills, neither of which are covered in intro programming class, right? In intro programming class, we, we worry a lot about like integer valued math and Booleans and like sorting lists and all that kind of stuff. But the reality is that many of the computations that we do involve floating point and, and, and numbers with decimal points and they're approximate. Um, that's sort of the class of algorithms that we'll be thinking about in this course. Um, in a funny historical, I actually don't know the, the historical story here, this is called numerical analysis, which I think to mathematicians is a really bizarre phrase because like arguably all of math is numerical analysis. Um, but specifically this phrase numerical analysis refers to the mathematics of sort of floating point stuff and, and algorithms and so on. And I think in general, like if you take a classical numerics class, you cover a lot of algorithms like Newton's method for root finding and, and Gaussian elimination for eliminating, uh, eliminate, inverting a, a, a matrix. And those are really critical algorithms, and we'll cover them in this course. But the reality, and a really weird thing about numerical methods, is for the most part, they are in some Python or MATLAB library that you will never touch. Right? This is different than, like, I think when you take 6006 or whatever the number is in, in the department these days, or right, the algorithms class, like, the point there is, like, really to design new algorithms. And so, like, you know, you cover searching and sorting and so on because these are, like, sort of templates for designing new techniques. In numerical methods, it's really actually not the case. This is a very different philosophy where there are some bread and butter numerical methods out there that are useful to understand and useful to know that other people have implemented them. And then your job is to make use of them in a clever way. Right? And so we'll spend sort of equal time in this course, not just deriving the basic techniques for like inverting a matrix or whatever, because the reality is that unless you are a specialist, the code that's built into your programming language is probably far better than anything you can write, at least that I can write. I should be careful. You guys are all brilliant MIT students. Um, so like really, the, the philosophy that I want to kind of convey to all of you guys is that there's sort of equal roles here. That on the one hand, you want to be a client of numerical methods and understand and to look at a problem in practice and be like, oh my god, I know what this is. This thing needs QR factorization. Or like, you, you know, this, this ODE I think I'm going to have to solve using a, like an exponential integrator, whatever. And that every once in a while, the numerical method fails. <laughs> Right? And, and when we, we do that, as clients, the first thing we have to do is decode the error message, which already requires some understanding of the algorithms underneath the, the hood. 
And then sometimes it fails for reasons that are like built into the assumptions of the techniques themselves. And then suddenly you flip your switch and you have to change to being a designer of numerical algorithms and coming up with your own implementation of some of these methods. But I think really any reasonable class that, that, that's covering this sort of introductory level numerical algorithm kind of stuff, you really should think of these two roles as being kind of democratic. That like just proving a bunch of convergence facts about numerical methods is actually maybe not the most useful skill for most of the people in our department. And so that's the philosophy we're going to cover today. You'll notice that the book has relatively few proofs, if we can avoid it. There are a lot of derivations, because there's a lot of formulas in this area. Um, and, and instead of that, what we've tried to do is to borrow lots of examples from different computational domains that sort of motivate why we need these different uh, techniques. Right? So that'll start actually with, I mean, with the very first homework. The, essentially, you're going to be implementing just gradient descent for a simple machine learning model and seeing that like, the numerics of that actually matter. <laughs> um, these are not just abstract considerations. Okay? And so really the skill, if, if you guys can come out of 6.S955 with any useful skill, the one I want it to be is to sort of start with a computational messy problem, you know, like, oh my gosh, my client wants me to predict the future and the stock exchange, and here's the data that I have, and here's the sort of dynamical model that, that I think is, is, is governing uh, what I observe here. You're going to reduce it to a numerical model and then sort of choose the appropriate algorithm. Notice that this is where we're a little different from like algorithms class. Like I'm not saying design an algorithm from the start. Um, and then sort of predict and understand when your problem is going to be well solved or not well solved by that numerical tool. Right? So this last little piece here is oftentimes called conditioning. Right? And we'll cover that in great detail today and in the next lecture. The basic idea that some numerical problems are just hard to solve and that's life in the city. <laughs> that it actually doesn't matter what the algorithm is. Like the problem itself is what's making your life difficult. Uh, and then finally, every once in a while, you use your commodity tool, you've paid thousands of dollars, and sadly that, that software doesn't work, and now it's on you to engineer your own tool, and we'll kind of hint at ways that strategies that you can do that. Does that make sense? This is sort of my, 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 my high level you know, motivation here. So, so to dive into, oh, did I see a hand? I'm sorry. Oh, oh, just a minute. So to dive into the details and be a little more concrete here, here's a tentative list of course topics. I've linked, you'll notice that the, the course syllabus look, links to a Google sheet with like the lecture topics per day that is very likely to get adjusted day by day. <laughs> um, so, you know, if you're like, oh my God, I really hate, you know, like SVD, like I just don't want to learn about it and no matter what, I'm not going to go to that lecture, then sadly for you, the day of that lecture is a little like plus or minus one because it depends how fast I talk in a given day. Um, but in any event, this is, is roughly our, our list of topics. We'll start uh, basically in today's lecture and in the next one talking about sort of high level considerations in numerical analysis. Like what are the different ways that we can measure how well a numerical algorithm performs because the reality in this domain is that very rarely do we solve a problem exactly. Right? I mean think about a piece of code for computing the square root of a number. Like the square root of two, like two I can store on my computer. The square root of two I can't, like at least in, in floating point arithmetic. And, and so like we need to come up with new notions of what it means for an algorithm to succeed. Uh, then beyond that, uh, so we'll also talk a little bit about how floating point numbers are stored on your computer. I promise we'll keep that to a minimum because I'm guessing many of you have either seen it before or couldn't care less and used the, the, the double precision on your laptop. Then we'll move on to numerical linear algebra. Um, numerical linear algebra is all about taking a matrix and factoring it in a million different ways. Right? Writing matrices as products of other things. And so we will cover the sort of basic uh, uh, linear algebra factorization that we all know and love. This is usually LU factorization, or really should be LUP factorization, QR, and then uh, end with some, some eigenvector stuff. We are not going to go into the details of some of the really fancy eigenvector solvers. Like, for example, like these Rayleigh Ritz methods and all these fancy things like self adjusted, restarted, Arnaldi, whatever iteration. Because the reality is that unless you are one of the like 100 people in the world that has to implement that software, chances are it's implemented for you. So, in lieu of that, we will spend more time kind of figuring out how to model problems as uh, eigenvalue problems computationally, understanding how to interface with these tools and so on. After that, we'll move on to nonlinear stuff. So we'll talk about root finding and optimization. Um, so we'll do this in both single and multiple variables. There are some really elegant, beautiful algorithms that sadly only work when your problem is one dimensional. Um, but we'll also talk a bit about quasi-Newton solvers, constraint optimization, and so on. Unlike many of the optimization courses here, we probably won't go through 
the big hierarchy of convex optimization problems and all the very specialized tools people use for that. And instead, we're more focused on the very broad toolkit for like, I have an objective function with a gradient and its constraints and I want to solve it. And maybe I don't want to solve it like the most tuned way possible, but I, you know, I want a very general tool. After that, we'll talk a little bit about interpolation and quadrature, like how to compute integrals and derivatives. Um, we'll probably throw onto this list uh, automatic differentiation, which is uh, I plan to cover a little bit. Um, interestingly, this is not typically covered in numerical methods that like, you know, I want to approximate the derivative of a function, then, you know, we spend a lot of time analyzing the formula, you know, f of t plus h minus f of t divided by h, um, and that's important to do. Uh, but these days, people often compute derivatives in a very different fashion. Namely, many of you have taken courses that use software libraries like, what, PyTorch, Jax, what are some of the other ones? TensorFlow, Cafe, do people use that still? That one's dead? Okay, it's hard to know. Uh, yeah, next year it'll change. Um, but these things don't approximate derivatives. They give you exact derivatives up to numerical rounding. Um, and they do that with a very different set of algorithms. It's called automatic differentiation. Uh, you might have also heard this as backpropagation. Yep. So we'll cover that in a, in, in a little bit of detail. Uh, and then finally, we'll, we'll conclude this course, again, time permitting, because I talk too much, uh, with some discussion of differential equation. Uh, in particular, we'll focus on ordinary differential equations. Um, and uh, I was looking, actually, it might be fun to cover actually a little bit of coupling um, approximating derivatives with uh, ODEs and, and talking about uh, methods like this neural ODE, which is quite popular uh, in the machine learning literature for differentiating the result of a differential equation solver with respect to its inputs and, and parameters. Um, and possibly, if there's interest, we can touch on partial differential equation, but my inclination is actually not to do that in this course because I think most uh, computer scientists are unfamiliar with like how to even write down a PDE, so like talking about numerical methods to solve it is kind of kind of useless, uh, unless you have a, a little more time for that. Also, we have some other courses in this department, specifically in that domain, that, that are quite good. They can go take Luca Daniels' class. That makes sense. Any questions about the syllabus here? Yes. Uh, how deep into ODE should we have been before this class? How deep into ODE should you be before taking this class? Well, unless you can, you know, like I put you on the board and you can prove uh, Picard iteration converges. <laughs> Uh, no, no, it's fine. Like just, just like f equals ma is, is, is probably good enough. Yeah. Okay. So that in concludes our introduction. Um, so what we're in, in the slides, by the way, there's a slick next button. This doesn't actually work in PowerPoint, but it will on your computers um, to load up the next uh, dia. Um, but with that, we'll get started with the first technical topic in this course, um, which is also sort of the most boring and least interesting. I'm sorry. We have to. It's it's like it's 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 the it's the rules. Um, which has to do with just the basics of like how to represent a number on a computer, how to analyze the error of different algorithms, and essentially this is going to give us a framework for understanding the performance of our numerical techniques for the rest of this course. Okay, so that's our, our basic setup here. Okay, so here's a piece of code. This is C++ because I'm old. In fact, it's probably like C++ 95 or whatever. This was probably some fancy like pointer thing that I don't know how to do in, in the latest version. Uh, and here, uh, what do I do? I have a variable x. I make a new variable y, which is x divided by 3. x is equal to 1, by the way. So y should be equal to 1 third, roughly. Yeah, I hope. Okay. And uh, I, I say if x is equal to y times 3, then I say that they're equal. Uh, otherwise, I say they're not equal. What do we think the, this code is likely to output? Yeah, like we're, we're hoping that 1 equals 1, which is like sort of mathematically what, what the, the, the if is testing. But what can go wrong? Like what's, what's, what's the issue here? Like can we store the number 1 third on a computer? And at least in like double here? I should keep prefacing that because there are formats that can. But um, yeah. I know you all know the answer to this because this is a stupid, boring question and you're all computer scientists. Can, like, is the number one third being accurately solved and stored in the variable y here? How many of us vote yes? How many of us vote no? How many of us are just like, hell no, I'm not going to vote. This professor has got his hand up. Like, my, my intern won't even vote here. It's really it's killing me. Yeah, yeah I, see, I see you back there. Okay, so yeah, the answer is that, no. This, this code is likely to say that these two values are not equal. And the reason is that every time that we do any computation at all with a floating point, or that decimal point in there, there's rounding that happens, right? And so essentially when we write numerical code, 
how often do we have like equal signs, like, we, like the Boolean equals? It's actually very infrequent because everything that we do is approximate, right? And what that means is that like, for instance, when we talk about a numerical algorithm being correct, we have to define what correct means. Does that mean correct up to floating point precision? Like if my double didn't round, then my algorithm would give me the right answer. Does it mean within numerical epsilon? Does it mean converges in some particular fashion? There are many different notions of correct here. <laughs> it's kind of a squishy thing in this particular domain, and it's one that we need to be a little bit precise about before we start actually introducing numerical techniques. Yeah? So another way to put that is that things that appear to be kind of mathematically correct on paper might not be numerically sound. So how should I fix this? Like, uh, let's continue in our goofy little example. I have this small piece of code. Let's say I wanted to check that 1 equals 1. <laughs> Obviously, this is a boring example, but we're starting easy in this class. How would you all debug this? So this outputs, you know, they're not equal. That's, that's scary. We, something went wrong. Yeah. Yeah, I'd use the difference. And what should I, what should I check about the difference? Yeah. I should, you know, maybe say x minus y times 3. Subtract those two things. And I expect that number to be very, very small, like close to 0, but not equal to zero. Now there's a question. How small? <laughs> How small is small? Is it 10 to the minus 6, 7, 8, 10 to the minus 22? Hard to say, <laughs> right? It depends on your numerical system and it depends on your tolerance. It depends on what doubles can store. I think a very standard answer here is to use a particular number called numerical epsilon. This is the smallest increment from the number one that your number system can represent. We'll come back to that in a few minutes. But notice that <laughs> this is really weird, right? If I want to compute, like I want to check whether one is equal to one, I, I actually check whether one and one are within some wiggle room. <laughs> and almost every calculation you will implement in this class is going to look like this, okay? Um, if, we, if we see that double equal sign in your code, you're going to lose lots of credit on your assignment. You heard it from me first here, from Chris second, because I'm not great yet. Okay. So uh, let's, let's dive into the details. Like when we write a piece of code like this, what's happening behind the scenes on our, our computer, right? Like on our arithmetic logic unit or whatever this magic abstract beast is inside of these, these laptops here. So in general, I think we can all agree that the standard way to store a number on our computer is in binary, right? So for instance, here's the number 463 in binary. It's 11100111. And of course, when we write that, really what we're doing is we're writing things in terms of power of two. So there's a really obvious way to take our uh, numbers and add fractional parts to them. And that would be to basically just go beyond the decimal point, just like what we do when we write numbers down. Right? So for instance, here, if I want 463.25, right, I can kind of agree that you know, I've added two bits to my number system here, but that these are like 2 to the minus 1 and 2 to the minus 2. And this is a perfectly reasonable way to store numbers on a computer. Yeah? Anybody know what this is called, this kind of computation? That's called fixed point arithmetic. Does anybody know why? I bet you can guess. Somebody knew? Because the decimal point doesn't move. It's fixed. It's right there. See, it's two. Yeah? Um, so in fixed point arithmetic, we just do like integers on our computer. We just kind of like shift our window a little bit to include some things past the, the decimal point. So what, uh, what's our, our problem here? Remember that our, our lecture is motivated by computing the number one third. Fun fact, in binary, one-third is equal to 0 .0101010, dot, 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 I believe. I actually haven't checked that in a while, but at least it was true a few years ago. So what are we to do? I, I write my piece of code. I'm using a fixed point um, thing. Maybe I have two decimal points uh, in my fixed point system. So then what is one-third equal to? It's 0.01, right? Which in like human words, what's 0.01 in binary? 0.25, that's right, it's, it's, it's one, one quarter. Hopefully everybody's following. And so that's the kind of thing that happens in fixed point arithmetic, is you have to round at every step of your computation, and that's going to become problematic, which we'll see in just a moment. So in particular, when we talk about fixed point arithmetic systems, they look like this. They're specified by a few parameters, right? Essentially, there's k and l, which are like the number of digits on the two sides of the decimal point here. Um, and, and yeah, the good news is that it's really easy to implement fixed point arithmetic on your, your CPU, even if you just have integer arithmetic implemented, right? Because if you just multiply all of your numbers by 2 to the k, I guess, and then like add them together and then multiply by 2 to the minus k, 
then notice that that addition operation is just an integer math. So basically, the good news is if you use fixed point uh, computation, it tends to be really, really fast. Because the, the uh, uh, at least old processors and computers, and, and to some extent modern ones, were really optimized for doing integer math. Yeah? Now, um, in fact, if you look at early graphics cards, GPUs, right, like these things that we now do deep learning on, um, they tended to only implement fixed point arithmetic. And that was because it was like blazingly fast, it's easy, there's no if statements, right? Like I don't have to worry about like shifting decimal points around. So the early like computer graphics tools and even machine learning software forced you to use fixed point arithmetic. But we'll see that's actually quite problematic in precisely these applications in a second. Okay? And so the good news is that fixed point arithmetic is really fast, it's easy to implement, it's just reusing the stuff you already know how to do with integers. The bad news is that it's a little inflexible. Yes? That's exactly right. So, in, uh, yeah. That's absolutely right. So there is a maximum number and a minimum number here. Um, I think that the, so the question, if I understand correctly, it was like, let's say that my number is one, 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 and I add one to that. What should come out of my system? Well, it's actually not clear, right? Like, I just can't represent that number on the computer. And so you have to read the standard, <laughs> where you have to talk to your engineers that, that actually implemented this thing to figure out what should happen in that case. Um, I mean, some old number systems would, like, round back off to, like, negatives, you know, the smallest number, which obviously has some uh, drawbacks, yeah? In fact, by the way, it's not clear how to represent positive and negative numbers here. Um, you could store a little bit in the front, which is plus and minus, but then zero is represented twice. And in fact, actually, you'll see in, in floating point systems, it's very common. Um, you, uh, for example, in IEEE double precision floating point, there's positive zero and negative zero. Um, and and, and that, that can create all kinds of weird bugs in your code. So this, these are all, this is a fantastic question. Essentially, what happens a lot in these number system things is that you're going to ask a lot of reasonable questions. And my answer is going to be, I don't know, you have to talk to your engineer. <laughs> like, you know, there's like a lot of like rounding and tie breaking and so on where there's no like mathematical policy. There's just something that has to happen behind it. Okay, so now let's see what goes wrong in fixed point arithmetic. I mean, it feels like a nice way to implement stuff, right? We're just reusing integer code that we already have around. Let's say we do some, some multiplication. So we have 0 0.1, and we want to compute 0 0.1 squared in binary. What is 0 0.1 in, like, human words? Runs with schmath. One half, thank you. Okay, so what is 0 0.1 times 0 0.1? This goes better for all of us if we answer quickly. It's a quarter, thank you. Okay, but a quarter is 0 0.01, and if I'm in a fixed point system with like one decimal point, what happens? Well, it just rounds off, I, I, get, I get zero, <laughs> right? And here's the thing, multiplication and division very quickly can change where I am on the, the, the sort of magnitude thing, right? Like, for instance, here, we have two numbers where like one floating point is probably good enough, but necessarily by multiplying them together, things have shifted to the right, right? And that's a very common situation to be in, and that's really where these floating point systems fall apart. It's basically any time you multiply and divide. Does that make sense? Chris, you're looking at the board suspiciously. Have I made a mistake? Can we stand by right now? Yes, it should, it, yeah, it's communicating to the laptop. But thank you. So the reality in scientific computing <laughs> is that we work with numbers on all kinds of ranges, right? Everything from like 9.11 times 10 to the minus 31. Anybody remember that? I had to Google it. It was, it was in my notes and I forgot. It was like the mass of what, a neutron, electron, proton? I don't know, in kilograms. Um, to 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd. These are all numbers that like scientists work with all the time. And the problem is like, well, if I wanted to use a fixed point number system to represent both of these things, I would need 23 plus 31 bits to, to represent such a thing, which is a lot of bits. Uh, and, and, and moreover, if I multiply two such numbers, then I've already like, lost the realm of, of computation I can do. And that's where, where fixed point math really is, is kind of falling apart. Does that make sense? And so what are we to do? Well, essentially, we can make a few observations about the way multiplication and division work that motivate a different number system. Um, and so here's one. First. Notice I wrote it as 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd. I did not write 6.02 to 0. 
because that's like not a very interesting way to write a number. And moreover, we tend not to have that many significant digits. Yeah? And there's one more operation, one, one more observation that I think is maybe a little bit implicit when we are designing these number systems, which is the following, that there are a lot of operations that are unlikely. <laughs> right? Like I think very often in, in you know, practical computing, there, there are very few environments where you're likely to be adding these two numbers together. Right? So somehow addition tends to happen on the same scale, multiplication and division tend to happen on, you know, tend to lead to very different scales. Does that make sense? So, that suggests that maybe our number system should change. And in particular, notice we already actually introduced a new number system, which is the 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd. We wrote it in a different way. And essentially, the way that almost everybody is storing floating point numbers on their computer, oh god, I already said it. Um, the, the, the most of the way that people use fractional numbers on their computer is to use a different representation called floating point, which is basically just, you know, scientific notation for computers. Right, so here is the way that floating point works. You essentially do like d0 dot d1, d2, d3, and so on, times 2 to the n. Does that make sense? So just like I had 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd, and remember the standard in scientific notation is there's always one digit to the left of the decimal point. So here, I can do exactly the same thing. So I'm going to write this as like a binary digit dot some other binary stuff multiplied by some exponent of 2, for example. So in order to represent such a numerical system, we need a few parameters. One is the base is uh, the letter B here. Um, in almost all computers, your base is 2. I suppose out there, there's probably sure some random engineers made a base 3 machine for fun, but uh, I don't think that's on any of the laptops in front of you. Uh, and then there's a few other uh, parameters here, namely the precision, which is like the number of digits past the decimal point that you store, um, and the range of exponents that you can have for n. n here is just an integer. Does this make sense? Now already there's a contradiction. Remember that I told you there's one digit to the left of the decimal point. But let's say that I'm in a binary system. What does the digit to the left of the, the decimal point kind of have to be? A one, right? For any number other than zero, which is a special number. So that actually suggests I can save, I can get slightly better number system, which is assuming the leftmost digit is a one. And then maybe I have a special convention for the number zero, like 1.000 times 10 to the negative whatever, we're just going to round off. Right? That's actually a very typical thing to do. So like real life floating point numbers, this is just the tip of a really boring iceberg, unless you're into this kind of thing. So I encourage you all, since you're all looking at your laptops anyway, to like go download the, the uh, IEEE floating point specification and give it a read. It is the world's least interesting document, where they go through like, you know, like, Floating point should be specified by three numbers and then you're done, but then you have all these different realities like when I multiply two numbers, how do I round? Like do I round to the even number or to the odd number? Or like, you know, if I have these subnormal things, like do I want to maybe make some evenly spaced numbers between zero and, and the first sort of non-zero value I can represent? Like engineering these systems, you have to be so careful because there's this amazing thing that we all take for granted, which is that you can write a piece of numerical code on your laptop and email it to a friend and it will give you precisely the same output. And notice that that's not obvious because of all this rounding, right? Like there are a lot of conventions you could use. And so that's why people are so careful when they write these specifications. Does that make sense? Okay. So a few properties of floating point systems. I promise this class gets more interesting. I hate this stuff. This is the interesting stuff that's going to start in the next lecture. Um, first of all, uh, one thing that I could do is take a number line and just put a little dot every time there's a number I can represent using my floating point system. And notice it'll have this kind of interesting pattern, right? Like I'll have, you know, B of them in one little region, and then a region that's like maybe twice as big with the same number, and then a region that's twice as big as that one. So they're, they're unevenly spaced, which makes sense, right? Because like in the 6.02 times 10 to the minus 23rd, or plus 23rd, you know, I, maybe the range there, like I'm moving in increments of totally, you know, 10 to the 23rd, whereas like I want to move in very small increments if I'm close to zero. Does that make sense? Um, so there's a vocabulary word we already mentioned here, which is machine precision, which is uh, usually notated as, sometimes they even call it machine epsilon, which is the smallest value you can represent above 1. So like in this number system here, I guess it would be 0 0.25. This would be a very crappy number system, but it's, it's hard to draw on the, on the line here. Um, incidentally, if you go on the Wikipedia page for machine precision, there's like a cute little proof that I almost added to this class, but I decided not to, which shows that like, Basically, machine epsilon kind of bounds the relative error of any calculation that you do 
Um, so like any piece of arithmetic that's kind of reasonable is bounded by machine learning epsilon, which is one reason to use that as sort of a prototypical small number on the computer. Um, in order to specify one of these systems, we need a rounding rule. This is really important. Rounding is one of these really annoying things that like no matter what you do is, is wrong, obviously, because it's rounding. <laughs> Um, but it can make a big difference. So for example, let's say that I write financial software, you know, and I have this giant table of all of the income for, for my quarter. For some reason, I was a bad engineer and I stored that in floating point, which is, by the way, a really bad idea. And now I want my total profit and I add it all together. You know, so what do I do? I write an algorithm that has a for loop down this column of my spreadsheet and I just keep adding items. Well, let's say that I round down every time that like, my, my numerical system is wrong. What's going to happen? Well, my financial software is going to be biased to under-report, right? And that's not so good. Uh, and so what happens is people design really careful rounding rules so that for typical calculations, you don't see a bias. It's impossible to do this perfectly, um, but you can do it okay. So a very typical thing to do is to look to the digit to the left of where you're going to round and round like up if it's even and down if it's odd or vice versa, so that at least the rounding behavior is kind of distributed through the number system. But there's no perfect solution here. Incidentally, there are some applications where that matters, like where I really want an unbiased estimate of the sum of a list, for example. What do you think I have to do in that case? I actually have to use a random number generator. Like, in that case, like multiplication can be really annoying to implement. You like multiply, and then you need to flip a coin to figure out how you're going to, to round your, your value. Yeah? There actually is software out there that'll do such a thing. Of course, there's a contradiction in terms there, because how do you flip a coin on a computer? Well, you probably implemented that also in a system that is, is, is deterministic and finite precision. So <laughs> it's very hard to do this really perfectly all the way down. Um, and finally, like I mentioned, there's a very common uh, convention, which is to just remove the leading one, at least in the binary system. Um, that's sometimes called normalizing your, uh, your, your, your floating point thing. The advantage here is that you now have one extra bit of precision. Um, the disadvantage is obviously you can't represent the number zero. Um, so, uh, you, you know, there's a trade-off. Yes? Oh, absolutely. So, so let's say that I just like, made a list of all the things, all the numbers that my uh, number system can represent, right? So in the uh, fixed point representation, those would be evenly spaced, right? It would look like the last digit. But here, they're not, right? Like, if you think about it, like, there's a bunch clumped towards zero, and then they start to spread out more and more, right? So like if I have a number on the order of like a thousand, then I can't add a tiny, tiny increment to it, but I maybe can add a tiny increment to a number close to zero. Right? That's the sort of weird property of this number system. So let's think about an example. So let's say that I'm in base 10 because I don't feel like thinking about math, and I have one digit of precision. So I have like 6.0 times 10 to the 23rd. Right? So what is the next number that I can represent in this system? If I want to add, well, I guess it would be 6.1 times 10 to the 23rd. Yeah? What is the difference between these two numbers? 10 to the 23rd, or 22. Yeah, you're right, sorry. <laughs> it wasn't intended to be a trick question, but you got it right. Uh, on the other hand, maybe I have 6.0 times 10 to the minus 52. Maybe for some reason my number system allows very large exponents. Right? Now, the next biggest system number I can represent is 6.1 times 10 to the minus 52. The difference between these two things is very small. Right? So if I just took all my numbers and lined them up with a the number line, there would be a big clump at zero, and then they'd start getting farther and farther apart. Fantastic question. Any, any, anything else? OK. So by default in our code, uh, we often all use the same thing, which is a, a particular thing called double. The, uh, Right, so when we store a double on our computer, uh, there, this is something that is uh, specified by the IEEE, which is sort of the universe, uh, you know, like this sort of professional organization of engineers. And this is sort of the very standard way to store a double precision floating point. And literally, like, people like, got together in like, one of those really boring hotel meeting rooms and like, debated how many numbers should go out, so, you know, like past a decimal point, something like that. Um, and then they wrote down the standard, and we all comply with it today. Right, so the IEEE 754 standard for 64-bit double, you know, notice that like, even if we all agree I want to use 64 bits to store my floating point number, there's still some decision I have to make. Like how many of those digits should go to like, the stuff past the decimal point and how many should store the exponent. Right? 
And actually, one thing we'll talk about in a second is that these decisions are getting reconsidered actually very recently and for some interesting reasons. So like in IEEE 754, this was designed like decades ago, and the main applications of floating point were in like scientific computing and simulation, right? And so they were doing these very precise calculations, they're predicting the weather, whatever, uh, and so it made sense to store a lot of precision, like 52 decimal points of precision in, this, in the standard here. And then a range of exponents, which is large, but not gigantic. Um, if you look in the standard, you'll see there's also special numbers for plus and minus infinity, not a number, and so on. There's a lot of little special cases. Um, they actually specify different rounding conventions. You can like flip them on and off if you write assembly code. But this number system was designed for scientific computing. It was not designed for a lot of modern applications we see today. So for example, many of the students in this class, just statistically speaking in course six, are probably going to try and go into some version of machine learning. Does this format actually probably make sense for implementing a machine learning model? I see a head shaking. Tell me, tell me more. Parallelism is one thing, um, but there's actually an even, even simpler explanation. Data is really noisy. <laughs> data is super noisy, right? And oftentimes the algorithms that we use to process data are even noisier. We're doing like stochastic gradient descent. We're generating random numbers everywhere. Does it make sense to do math with 52% like digits of precision on data where maybe after the like three digits it's, it's just random anyway? Probably not, yeah? So in a funny way, we are like burning through the rainforest, spending a bunch of electricity doing calculations in these machine learning models that are clearly irrelevant, right? And that's just because some, a bunch of engineers in the 80s decided this is the number of decimal points we need, yeah? And, and so actually, if you look, and the problem is that, like, this is built into your hardware. You don't get an option. Like, you can't, you know, if you go into C++, I think trying to convince double precision to say, like, no, I like more exponent and less precision is not really a thing I can do, yeah? And there's good reason for that, because like the actual circuitry of your processor is designed for a very particular floating point, because we do so many of these calculations. So sadly for us as MIT engineers, it might be out of reach. We're stuck with doubles, because that's what the IEEE did. But if we work at a company like Google that does so much calculation that they actually manufacture their own chips, then maybe it makes sense to reconsider this decision. So in fact, just a couple years ago, Google Brain released its own floating point format. It was really fun you know, for me, because I'm a numerical guy. To, to, to read this, because I think it's the first time somebody thought critically about this stuff in a while. <laughs> um, and in particular, there is a new data type that you can use specifically on these Google TPUs, which are used for machine learning applications. And notice, for one, they have 16 bits of, 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 of total storage, so they're just smaller. And moreover, most of those bits are now not being used for the decimal point stuff, but rather for the exponent. And that makes perfect sense. If you look at the typical kind of implementation of like a neural network, the numbers traverse these huge ranges because you're like multiplying by these neurons that are fluctuating in value a lot while you train your model. But the precision is very low because your data is messy. Uh, and so this is a really interesting, very careful engineering. And what they showed is they can engineer these TPUs to be much more efficient for a lot of different reasons and, and basically have still similarly performing machine learning models, even though the actual numbers going through these things are, are less accurate. Does that make sense? So anyway, this is just to kind of motivate that like somehow these are these low level things that we don't even think about are actually worth reconsidering sometimes. Um, in fact, there's some really cool machine learning research papers out there that show with like four bits of precision you can like train reasonable machine learning models, which is really fun to look at. So like you can, you know, like use your TI-83 processor to like do, you know, some, some reasonable tiny neural network sometimes. I wouldn't recommend it, but you can. Okay, so those are our two basic number systems. One thing we, before we kind of move on to the next uh, topic here is to just note that there, there are many others. Like this is, this is the beginning of a long, you could build a whole course on weird number systems and there are specialty applications where this matters. So for example, let's say that I really need infinite precision. When I compute one third, I want it to be one third, right? Then maybe what I do, for example, is to represent numbers as fractions, yeah? So for instance, like if I want to do addition, multiplication, subtraction, division, right, then I know that I can always write it as the ratio of two integrals, or integrals, integers, yeah? So maybe what I do is I make a new data type that's two numbers, which is the ratio, yeah? 
No, this is perfectly reasonable. And in fact, like operator overloading in programming language can make it not so hard to work with this stuff and templating and all that fun programming language thing. Um, but there can be a, a few practical issues with these matters. For one, it's very easy to get numerical blow up. So for instance, here I have just like a relatively modest calculation that's led to like giant integers on the right hand side. Moreover, let's say that I want to check if two of these numbers are equal to each other. <laughs> can I check that like A is equal to A prime and B is equal to B prime? Your TA is nodding, but he's wrong. Because like, let's say I have one half, I could also write that as two fourths. So I need to reduce my fractions before I can do that. Yeah? I get to pick on this one. Okay, um, and moreover, like, you know, this number system is great if all I'm allowed to do is add, subtract, multiply, and divide, but then like, let's say I compute the square root. W what do we all know about square roots? Can I, can I write them as rational numbers? No. So this is a rabbit's hole. So then people say, great, so now I'm gonna make a new thing, which is the ratio of A plus B times the square root of C, you know, divided by D plus E to the square root of F, or something like that. And that looks great until you wanna like compute the area of a circle. And now you need to throw pi in there. Um, and, and there are entire you know, software libraries out there that, that start building these number types where they say, here is the set of calculations that the algorithm I'm gonna do eventually is gonna need, and now I'm gonna work backward to figure out the type of number system I need. Then there's, there's some really beautiful systems. This is actually close to my heart. Uh, my research field outside of this course is in geometry. And in geometry, these kinds of calculations are really critical. So for instance, the difference between two lines being parallel and intersecting is numerical precision. Right? Like you can't really check if two lines are parallel. And so for a lot of these like geometric algorithms, they actually tend to be implemented in these infinite precision systems so that you really can have what they call predicates. Like are these things equal or not? Right? Um, so if you read old school computational geometry books, they often go through all these details. I don't recommend it because it's awful. A different way um, to do infinite precision is as follows, is to never do math. <laughs> So like when I say compute the square root of x, then behind the scenes my computer just stores a new thing called the square root of x. Right? So in other words, it just stores a computational tree that gets me to the value that I computed. You know, so for instance, so I want the square root of one third, then behind the scenes, this is like maybe what my representation does. The advantage here, of course, is that it's infinite precision and basically you can incorporate, encapsulate any um, operation you could want, right? It's just like another tag. Um, but let's say I want to check if two numbers are equal. How do I do that? It can be really complicated, right? Like, like this, like basically all of your high school algebra class is doing that for certain, you know, like weird expressions of having square roots, for example. It's, it's not so obvious. Um, and, and, and like, God forbid, you include sine and cosine, right? There are all kinds of weird identities there. Um, so for instance, if I have a, a number that I stored on my computer as sine of something squared plus cosine of something squared, I would need my software to be able to recognize that that thing is equal to one. Right, um, so you can imagine that this is basically equivalent to implementing like a complicated like a computer algebra system. Yeah? Um, moreover, like implementing comparators, like is this number bigger than the other? There's some really clever algorithms that try to do this in a way that doesn't involve like, you know, doing this to a million digits of precision until you're confident that they're somehow bracketed away from each other. Um, but they're they're quite complicated to implement in practice. Anyway, this is the part of the lecture where I'm just like pointing you toward fun, interesting topics that we don't get to cover in this class, but are, are things to like kind of think about. Yes? Uh huh. I didn't know PyTorch had a symbolic option, but if it does, then, then yeah, it's, it's doing something similar to that. Ah, I'm guessing it is n very inefficient relative to not using that package, but I could be wrong. <laughs> yeah, um, I mean basically anything on a GPU that even has like an if statement and it, it's already pretty slow, right? And here you obviously need a lot of conditional. Um, there are other things that you can do. A different thing that, that folks will do, which isn't quite infinite precision, but is like sort of some compromise, is to maybe say that like, I'm gonna bracket the number I do my calculation in. Right, so now maybe I store two floating point values, like you know, x plus or minus epsilon. And then when I add two numbers together, then may, like maybe I, I, I start adding that to my, my bracket, right? Notice that now my predicates are really weird, right? Like, so for instance, now I can say these two numbers are equal, these two numbers are not equal because their, their intervals don't overlap, and then sometimes it's inconclusive, right? And then I have to go back and redo my calculation with more precision, yeah? Um, in fact, uh, the, if you continue in the geometry world, if you Google for the phrase epsilon geometry, 
there's an old PhD thesis that works out like if I do math here, then like what does it mean for lines to be parallel and not parallel and this kind of funny like bow tie shape in between. There's some really beautiful figures to look at there. Um, the good news is that this is much easier and more efficient to implement, right? I mean, here you kind of round everything up and then down and that gives you some notion of your, your bracket, um, but your, your, your calculations are no longer precise. And actually just uh, last year there was a, it, 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 shockingly, there's a, there's a research paper in computer graphics domain that actually uses this to great effect um, on a neural network representation where they say that these calculations are not so good, it's very easy, like especially when you multiply and divide, for these epsilons to get very large very fast. But um, there's sort of a generalization of this theory called range analysis where you kind of like, if you think of this as like the constant term in a Taylor series, they kind of like maintain like a linear term and a quadratic one that brackets your calculation. Um, and they show that you can actually get very accurate queries very efficiently for certain models with relatively few bits, which is so cool. This is, it's a fun paper to look at. I encourage you to do. Okay, so generically speaking, hopefully what I've convinced you guys so far is that there are many sources of error <laughs> when we do numerical stuff. And this is just scratching the, 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 the head of that, right? Like for instance, you know, just the fact that our, our decimal point is maybe fixed or can only float in a certain range already gives us error in a numerical calculation. We're also going to approach different types of error, like discretization error, right? Like, so let's say I want an algorithm for, an algorithm for approximating the derivative of a function, you know, and all I have access to is the function itself. Obviously a reasonable algorithm might be to fix some magic constant epsilon and then, and then evaluate the formula I have here. That's inexact. But that might be okay, because for instance, it could be that the error of that approximation is lower than the rounding error on your computer anyway. Right? So there's a balance between all of these different terms. And moreover, there's going to be modeling error, which is very common in numerical applications. Right? So unlike a lot of the integer applications we have in the universe, our data is often noisy. We have tolerance for error, you know, and, 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 and building that into our model is going to be okay. Right? So an extreme version of that, you know, like if I'm doing a weather simulation and I'm trying to predict the weather in the United States, then like a butterfly flapping its wings in Indonesia is probably not going to affect it a whole lot, but it does perturbatively, and, and of course that, that leads to, to error in our calculation as well. And, and kind of related to that is input error, where essentially, you know, even just the initial conditions for the, the physical simulation I'm doing are not measured with, with great precision. Okay. So my point here is that this is a universe where we make a lot of mistakes. <laughs> yeah? so, so to get you thinking about that, for example, why don't you guys tell me, so what would be some sources of error that might simulate, you know, affect a, a, a stock market simulation? You know, I want to use, I want to solve Black-Scholes equation or something like that. I only ask easy questions. I know you guys can come up with reasons why a financial simulation is probably not very accurate. Yeah. Sure. So, like, you know, we are, we might be using floating point, and and so there's some rounding error. I would argue there's probably more significant sources of error in a financial simulation. Yes. Yeah, modeling is super hard, right? Like on the one hand, for example, like it turns out humans are really unpredictable. They're very random. So if I have a differential equation predicting the stock market, it might be okay for a little while, but like there are a lot of factors, like, you know, the whatever like world events that happen that, that probably aren't included in my numerical model. And then as you say, there, there's input error as well. Uh, for instance, my, 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 my partner works at, at a company that competes with these Bloomberg terminals and like just asking for data is expensive. <laughs> So it might be that you don't get the whole, you know, financial market information when you're trying to do your simulation and you have to kind of infer something. Any, any other ones? Yeah. Yeah, it might be low quality data or not measured very often. It might be that we predict time on a particular finite scale and something interesting happens at a scale below that. There's just like any number of these things, right? I mean, like it's so easy to come up with like Different things that can go wrong in a numerical calculation. So in general, when we talk about error, which is going to be our kind of next topic. We'll start with that today and we'll continue next time. I'm watching the clock, don't worry. Um, there are a lot of different ways to measure error. Again, most of today's lecture is basically like high school math and science class, and then we get to do all the fun stuff for the next N lectures for large N. Um, the obvious way that you measure error of a calculation is the difference between the approximated value and the true value. But of course, because things uh, traverse many scales, probably relative error is, is what you often look for, where you divide by the true value. 
Um, so for instance, we see that a lot. You know, we do a calculation, maybe in inches, and we either have you know, plus or minus 0 0.02 or 1%. That's the difference between absolute and relative error. Um, notice in floating point, this is uh, actually a really critical distinction. Um, and there's no right notion for, for what to use. So for instance, here, um, I wrote a little piece of code in, in MATLAB, I believe, to evaluate the function that I've written down on the, at the bottom of the slide here. So this is e to the x minus 1 divided by x, all that minus 1. So there's a problem, right? So as I take x to 0, what, you know, the numerator, you know, e to the 0 is 1. Thank you. <laughs> okay, everybody, what is e to the 0? Thank you. Uh, so what's 1 minus 1? Thank you. So this goes to 0 as x goes to 0. What is the limit of x as x goes to 0? 0. Right, so I'm like dividing two very small numbers when I do this numerically. So when I plot this function, I mean, it should be smooth. Like, it's a nice looking function. Um, but here is actually what it looks like in, in double precision, which is kind of wild. <laughs> um, notice that the absolute error here is bounded, right? It looks like it's bounded by like 10 to the minus 7, roughly. Is the relative error bounded? Actually, no, right? Because you notice that the true value is 0, right? So as I go to 0, I'm basically taking this constant value, at least in this little bracket here, and dividing by a smaller and smaller thing. So the relative error of this calculation actually explodes. Right? So depending on your context, it might be that reporting one measurement, the other, or both is, is really what you care about. That makes sense? Um, this is, by the way, an IEEE floating point. I, you know, there, there are other number systems out there that might do better. OK. By the way, just in this calculation, there are multiple sources of error. So one of them would be rounding. Um, if I'm doing it in IEEE, can, can you guys spot any other one? Does your CPU have a special e to the x chip in it? No, it only knows how to add, subtract, multiply, and divide. Yeah? So there's actually another source, and I did not measure which one is which here, which could be causing problems, which is that when you compute exponents, that's also an approximation. Right? We haven't covered how to do that in this class. <laughs> um, and, and, and so there's a lot of different things that can go wrong. I believe the standard in most of this software is that basically that, that's a trustworthy thing at all the different numerical scales, but that's the thing you have to check. OK, so that's, uh, that's our, our high level story. But here's the only thing. Like, in, in most software, you know, like let's say I write this piece of code. And now I, I, I go back to my computer and I say, OK, I want to write a piece of code that does this calculation and also tells me the error of the calculation. You know, that would be convenient, because then I could look and say, how much do I trust this software? Huh? Is that a piece of code I can write? No, right? Because if I knew the difference between the true solution to my problem and the one that I approximated, I could get a much better you know, piece of software by just subtracting the two and adding it to my output. Yeah? Like, like there's, there's, there's no reason um, that you can compute error because it requires knowing the true value. Right? So, so what do we do in, in, in practice? I mean, the, the issue here is that error is just hard to compute. Is that we don't. We're just conservative. We try to bound error. Right? So we're going to come up with different techniques throughout this course that are going to say, like, I can be pretty confident that my error for this calculation is less than 10 to the minus 6. It might be 10 to the minus 9, but I don't know that. All I know is that it's less than 10 to the minus 6. Does that make sense? And moreover, moreover, oftentimes we'll use things like Taylor series and so on that are, are only valid because the numbers that we're going to be working with in error tend to be very small. <laughs> right? So um, yeah, so let's, let's do an example of that. Let's say that I want to write a piece of software for solving root finding problem. This is a very classic numerical problem. Right? So I'm given access to a function f. Right? I input a number, it outputs another number. And I find a location at x where f of x is equal to 0. By the way, does anybody know algorithm for solving this? There are many. Newton's method. Yeah, that's a classic one. Or bracketing is another, bisection. Um, right, so what happens in this code? It runs for a while, and eventually it gives me some, some x star. And it says, OK, I think f of x star is, 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 is basically 0. Is it likely to be exactly zero? Eh, no, right? but it's likely to be close to zero. So, in other words, when I write, when I run a piece of code, it doesn't output x star. It outputs this x est here, which is my estimation of x star. Right? So, so uh, let's let's continue our example here. What would be the um, the absolute error here, the forward error of our, our calculation? Well, it would just be the difference between x and x star, right? But again, we can never compute this value, right? Can, 
you guys think of any other ways that I could evaluate how well my code is doing? So one way is to just is to approximate error. So here's an idea. So I, I have access to this function f, right? What happens when I put x est into f? Does it give me zero? Maybe if I'm lucky. But it's more likely to give me a number close to zero. But I think a very typical thing that all of you guys are likely to do is what? To put in your thing, evaluate f, and if that number is really close to zero, to say, oh, okay, then x est must be pretty good, right? Is that necessarily the case? I think the answer is probably not. So let's say that I have a function and it's got a very low slope like that, right? So notice that I can be all, you know, so here's x star, right? There's my actual root. But I could be like all the way over here somewhere and the value of f is, is still pretty small, right? So clearly these two notions of error don't necessarily align, right? Like, so there's two different notions now. There's one is I put in x and I get zero into f. And the other is just the difference from the true root x star. So these two things have names. One of them is called forward error, and the other one's called backward error. And backward error is one of these annoying things to define in words, but it's actually usually pretty intuitive in practice when you work it out. So for instance, for root finding, the forward error would just be the difference between like x and x star. And the backward error would be like evaluate f at these places and, and, and figure out how close it is to zero. If you want to put that into words in a very generic way, you end up with this horrible definition, which I've tried for years in writing this book to like rephrase in a way that isn't awful, which is to say that the backward error of a calculation is the amount that the problem statement would have to change to make the approximate solution exact. So let's see why that works for, the, for, for this problem. So notice that like at x est here, I evaluated f and I got this positive value. Yeah? So the backward error is this thing because it's saying that like, well, let's say my piece of code actually were to find a value f, you know, find a point where f is equal to 0 0.0001. Well, then I succeeded completely, perfectly, <laughs> right? So the difference between the right-hand side zero and the right-hand side that actually came out of f is the backward error. Does that make sense? Or like, let's say that I write a piece of code for computing square roots. And my square root code tells me that square root of two is approximately equal to 1.4. Okay, so then uh, very concretely, the forward error would be what? It would be the absolute value of 1.4 minus the square root of 2, which is, fun fact, um, equal to 0 0.0142, like that. Notice that there's a dot, dot, dot there, which is a problem. <laughs> yeah? What's a different way that I could measure error here. Well, I could take 1.4 and I could square it. I can actually do that in exact arithmetic quite easily, right? So my backward error here is maybe 1.4 squared minus 2, which is convenient. These are numbers we can actually work with. And this is equal to 0 0.04, okay? So those are our two different notions. That's for square root. Um, a different one might be to solve ax equals b, right, like our linear algebra code, right? So notice that matrix vector multiply is usually fairly reliable, but then solving a linear system might be harder, right? So in that case, maybe my, my forward error is going to be like x minus the true solution, and then my backward error is going to be ax minus ax star, which is just b. That makes sense. Notice that this guy is actually computable, right? Like I can do a matrix vector multiply, but like here I need to know the solution to my problem. Okay, so there's an obvious question here. We have two different notions of error, and you might ask like, when is one predictive of the other? And the answer is it depends on your problem. So this is where we're going to stop for today because we're out of time. But essentially, there's a really critical word in numerical analysis, and it's the one that I want you to think about until I see you on Tuesday. And I'm going to see all of you on Tuesday. You're not going to leave me just because one boring lecture on, on numerical stuff. Um, which is to say that a well-conditioned problem, like another one, in other words, a problem that I can solve and be pretty confident about, is one where small amounts of backward error, remember that's the error I can actually measure, is predictive of small forward error. And an ill-conditioned or a poorly-conditioned problem is the opposite of that. Does that make sense? So in practice, 
what we're going to do is we're going to measure a particular value here called the condition number, which is the ratio of these two things. And we're going to try and bound them. So the condition number is going to be the ratio of forward to backward error. And we're going to see that that's actually a number we can often bound or estimate pretty easily. And so essentially, this is going to be our way to say, like, we do a calculation, we compute some version of condition number, and if that condition number is, what, low or high, then I can be confident. Tell me. What is a good condition number? Low, right? Because I want low forward error. <laughs> yeah, this is an easy one to get backward, to, to get backward. Ah. Um, so, we'll, so we'll start our next lecture by showing that the condition number of uh, computing root finding is roughly 1 over the derivative. And notice that makes sense because, like for instance, in our ill-conditioned problem on the board here, notice that the slope here is very low, so 1 over this is quite high. <laughs> so we're going to uh, start by kind of motivating that formula. All right, any questions or final thoughts before we finish for the day? All right, fantastic, folks. So the first two chapters of the book are online, as are these slides. So get started on that. Um, if you want to get started on your homework, you can. It's already on there. It actually works through the condition number of computing log sum x, which, fun fact, was just computed about three years ago in the research literature. So you're now going to re-derive a, a modern research paper. So with that, have a lovely weekend, and I will see you on Tuesday. Let me uh, see if this thing actually worked. <laughs>